Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Happy Monday. This is Faith Family Focus, and I am one of your co-hosts, Faith Suggs, former Duke Women's Basketball graduate and current marketing manager for NIL and social media strategy with SIG Sports, as well as CEO and founder of Brand by Faith. And this wonderful man next to me is my father, Schaefer Suggs, former NFL player with the New York Jets and the Cincinnati Bengals, and has also served on the NFL PA as VP and on the executive board, also known as the RPFPC. Morning, Dad. How are you? Morning, Faith. How are you? I am good. I Morning. am good. Peachy. Nice Monday. It's almost like the temperature changed on us <laughs> <laughs> a little bit over the last, uh, I mean, I think, what is it, Thursday we had 70s, and yesterday was like 30 degrees. So right. it feels about right. Well, you know, I was in New Haven Friday and Saturday, the temperature was 70, 75 degrees. And then I came back on Monday, I mean, on Sunday morning and just to get off the plane onto the, uh, the you know, the, the walkway through to the, the temperature was like 30 degrees, 35 degrees. So before I did anything, I stopped and opened up the luggage and got my, my big old yellow coat and put it on because it, it was, a, it was like 30, 40 degrees difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, climate control. We're, there's bad things happening. <laughs> Our ozone is weakening and we're all thrown off. But yeah, no, that's the, this was a perfect example. If you don't know what's going on right now with our earth, now you know, because it was a nice beach day on Thursday over here. We said that beach day? <laughs> I would go. That was like a nice average fall day in California. I was still trying to get my, uh, there you go. <laughs> it was a night. Nice it was beautiful. Hey, uh, I just realized that uh, NIU had their first game on on um, Saturday. No, Friday was Friday. Second game on Friday. The second game on Friday, and they lost. So yeah, I saw that. And then they'll play again tonight. So right. we'll see how that goes. I mean, it was, are you gonna go? <laughs> yeah, you can come if you want. Um, but I'm obviously not trying to give the world our information. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I keep forgetting that we're live on. Call me offline. I got you, brother. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, no, no, no. And yeah, basketball's underway. College basketball's off. Like last week was the first week. It was kickoff for college and city way basketball men and women. Um, already seen some disappointing start for some schools mm -hmm. obviously and then i got to watch gonzaga play michigan state michigan state was impressive but gonzaga's just it's just gonzaga it's one of those things one of those schools that you just cannot handle duke's been interesting so far duke women has been interesting so far both are undefeated both are having annihilating upset like um defeats like they've been, they've been annihilating people yeah so which is normal they would never book a game that they can't win by 40. That's the point of the beginning of the season. You don't book games that you can't win by 40. Um, but yeah, so basketball is off to the races, which is exciting because this is my favorite time of year when there's like 85 basketball games on TV. We'll get there going. But so far, that top 25 is looking real interesting for this upcoming year. Right. You have a favorite that you're rooting for? Don't say Ball State because we can't root for them. But do you have a, a favorite college basketball team you're going to root for this year? So I'm not where you are with it yet. I'm not. I, I got to get it out of the completely get out of the football season before I try to get well into the, uh, the basketball. Football game. season's basically over. I just saw a bowl game happen the other day. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think it's funny that the college football playoffs. I don't know. The whole entire college football schedule is very, very unique in how they built it. Right. Um, and I, I have trouble following it. Sometimes, but I do know that Duke football won a bowl game. Slow clap for us. Doesn't happen often. But and someone said, I guess all we needed was a new coach. So, so, so Duke football, the, um, they got a bowl game, something okay. like that. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, basketball, normally I, I probably seen hit the basketball right after Thanksgiving. Everybody comes back for their Thanksgiving tournaments. They get, once the season starts, you know, Everybody get their kinks out, but normally after Thanksgiving, teams start getting into conference play. I start paying more attention to college basketball then. I guess. Yeah. So, 
I guess. Yeah, Duke just had a four-game winning streak, just beating Virginia Tech, which we never beat Virginia Tech, um, 24 to, like, seven. So that guarantees them to have a bowl game, which is always nice to see because um, we fall short in our football every year. But it is nice, encouraging when we can win some games. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of who my favorite – team so far Notre Dame big win we didn't get to talk about that but they were exciting right now I really like Notre Dame football and I know that his leash is shorter than everybody else's so I really am rooting for him to do well there because that's a hard school to win at it's a hard school to lose at but it's definitely a hard school to win at when you have the target on your back a little bit good morning good morning Hazel I love where I guess come in and they give us comments it's a special time of year with Thanksgiving coming in, so it's good to hear everybody. But yeah, Notre Dame is uh, when they beat um, Clemson last week, they really opened some eyes. Um, Tell me, does that say more about Clemson than it does Notre Dame? Does it say no, more about both, Notre Dame? Both, both. But you know, you have you have a really good foundation to build off of. Uh, Clemson might have been a little overrated, but then you playing in South Bend. Um, yeah. with <laughs> touchdown Jesus, anything can happen at Notre Dame University. So, I guess just, someone said the other day, like, who had the bigger win that weekend, Notre Dame or LSU? Oh, that was big of course, I'm trying to yeah. connect oh. those two, um, which that was interesting to me, but I was like, LSU is LSU, right. They have a, a standard they have to uphold. And I really did like that football game with them in Alabama. That was a very good football game. Poor Nick Saban. Um, there's another thing I wanted to go over. NFL was a – what, I mean – oh, great, great. Yeah, so you, you're seeing the, the parody. So teams like Minnesota are, are taking – I mean, Buffalo has had two losses. Josh Allen is showing that he's not invincible. Um I mean, that was probably one of the most exciting football games I've seen. I mean, you're on the one-inch line for the Vikings. You don't make it in. Okay. Buffalo gets the ball on the one-inch line and fumbles, and now and they get a touchdown. I mean, the 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 drama from that game was just unbelievable. But if I were a Buffalo, Buffalo Bills fan, which I got some really close ones, they were very silent. It was like crickets yesterday. Uh, I didn't hear too many. To me. Their tunnel, their their cave. <laughs> but uh, Minnesota, Minnesota is, uh, and then of course, you know, Green Bay gets a big win in in in, in Dallas, which was Green big. Bay. Tom Brady, yeah. once again, so don't Tom Brady, and that might have been just what was holding him back. He's 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 rocking and rolling now. Well, the season's starting now. Yeah, so during the season now, this next this next half of the season will determine um, you got a whole bunch of strong teams. I mean, there's so much parity in that league. I mean, look at that AFC East with Miami, the Jets, you know, you got the Patriots, you have Buffalo, you you have a tough, you have a tough conference over there. So, so I guess I have a question is the Jets in the playoffs. Do we know like, like how many more wins do they need to solidify their spot? Well, yeah. He, they, so you won't, you, so they are what? Five and two. Five and two, six and two. Uh, we're only halfway through the season, so you're not gonna really determine who's gonna be in the playoffs. So probably, you, you know, when you get game fifteen, game sixteen, you know, you'll start uh, seeing. But right now, right now, the foundation is set that it's gonna be six and three, really close call at the end. You know. Yeah, it is. It looks very balanced. You got the Maybe team. Buffalo is big. That's a big, like, in terms of, like, the eye test and, like, when you are on the bubble or, like, you're str- like they're trying to put the numbers together, them beating Buffalo was a big gift for them. Right. To a point where it kind of relieves a little bit of the pressure on them a little bit. Um, but hey, I'm going to pivot really quick. I don't know if you're aware of what happened with the Baltimore Colts. I mean, the Indianapolis Colts. No, what happened? They hired Jeff Saturday as a head coach who has never coached a Dallas professional football. They made him head coach, the interim head coach. And the ripple effect, it, it actually sent out through the league and some of the announcers. Um, so, you know, that opens the door to a lot, right? Here's a guy who's never played a down, 
play a uh, coach a down of professional football, and they made him a uh, head coach. Um, I did see Joy Taylor make some comments on it, um, and she doesn't hold back <laughs> at all. Um, so so he never coached a down football. Has he been? No, he was a he was an announcer, ESPN announcer. So, so <laughs> he's never coached football. I guess my first the question. He played for, the, he played for Indianapolis Colts. Mm -hmm. He's a Hall of Famer. So let me say something. How is that any different? Like, I just want to have a conversation because we need to understand why this is such a big deal on the the besides the race thing. Because that we there let's like there's no elephant in the room in this conversation. Besides the race thing, right? What is the difference between them and the NBA? Let's have a conversation with about Jason Kidd. Let's have a conversation about Steve Nash. Let's have a conversation about Steve, let's particularly have a conversation about Steve Nash, who is no longer the head coach for the Brooklyn Nets, but was it's that player coach connection hire. Uh huh. Like they hire because you play, because you have stake in our organization at some point, you have a historical piece, you have been around the game, you've been around the organization. It's like when they made Magic Johnson GM for the Lakers, that wasn't smart. But it made sense to them at the time for marketing, for ticket sales, for for all that stuff, right? Larry Here, Bird. They made Larry Bird a coach. Larry Bird. Larry Bird did not want to coach. <laughs> Jerry West didn't want to coach. Right, like right. there's a lot of things that go into this where we are doing that player coach hire before they've ever coached a single game, regardless of any level, right? College is a completely different play. College football is a different game to coach than the NFL, right? Different rules, different regulations, different type of players, different dynamics, right? It's a whole different thing, right? In comparison to like NFL to high school, high school to college, every level is unique in itself, right? So when you hire somebody without them ever having the actual hands-on experience at the helm of an organization at the professional level with 21 to 36-year-old men, it's very interesting of a hire. And it's almost like, let's not forget, he is interim. So all he got to do is fill out the finish out the season. And that's when I think we have to have more of a conversation about the race thing and the, the level of privilege and opportunity you have within the NFL to become a head coach in comparison to how we see it for black coaches, you know? So I, I guess that there is two different um, conversations to where for sure is that uh, the team organizations are very comfortable on the interim level to hire someone that has been a part of the culture but then after this season now he won a game right after this season it'll be interesting to see what that looks like in terms of uh because indianapolis coaches have hired uh they had tony dungy they had they had two or three african-american coaches so yeah that's not an issue there in indianapolis well, United States of America elected Barack Obama and then they elected Donald Trump. So I agree with you on that sense, that conversation, except for we got to be careful because even when you make two steps forward in historical hires in Tony Dungy, like the like the favorite black head coach in the NFL, people loved him. Right. People still mm -hmm. defend Tony Dungy even after everything just happened recently in his career. Remarkable man. Mm -hmm. Right. But administrations turn over, teams get sold. The Earth Days have been there forever. The Earth Days have been there forever. So it's here's my thing. That's why I know it's not a like, yeah, okay, I guess, whatever. It's more along the lines of who has the opportunity to be across the table to even be able to be like, yeah, sure, why not? I'll go take it for a run. Right? I'll go be the interim, interim head coach for the Indianapolis Colts in the National Football League and see what I can do. Right. That's more of the conversation when we go into that direction. Right. It's more along the lines of like, how did he get to sit down across from them and have the level of belief in his professionalism and his ability to coach? Because, Dad, you know it and I know it. Everybody that plays can't coach and everybody that coaches can't play. So sometimes you have those dynamics. But I guess we just will find out in this this these next couple games. I will say this. You said he did win a game. OK have the conversation let's let me ask you a question is it harder okay i'm sorry here here is it more important to have a great coach to win 
at the college level or at the professional level? Is it more important to have a great coach at the college level or at the professional level to win football games? I think they're equally as important, honey. It's it's because it's not the same on the the right. football side. Yeah, I think it's equally important in football. I mean, um, I, I it's so easy to to change head coaches now. Um, yeah, you know, okay. Here's the question: What universities have been successful? The universities that have been very successful are the universities that have had long tenured coaches. The professional mm-hmm. football teams that have been really successful have had a history of having long tenured coaches. Belichick, mm-hmm. Saban, okay. Um, you know, those you look at those coaches, they've been around for a while. There's no turnover. Um, you know, they've they they have the formula. So I don't know. It's to me, I think it's it's all relative. Um you know, you, you see universities not hesitating to buy out coaches' contracts these days. Right. Well, like, and that's what, that's my biggest thing is I think it's almost unacceptable how loosey-goosey we've gotten with our coaches and, like, through the loyalty maybe we have towards that profession. I mean, I just – I think that, like, in the professional league, this is not just NFL, NBA, it's hard. Hard. If you don't win, think about it. Larry Brown was the Lakers head coach for how many games? I think it was like five games. And they were like, no, no, no. Right. And it's like, oh my goodness. Like, look at, you know, look at my situation. Programs? When the Jets hired Lou Holtz, Lou Holtz is making it through the Jets season. Right. I yep. mean, it's, it's, it, you got, it got to be the right, it's got to be the right. Um, place some college coaches don't transcend into play at being professional coaches. Uh, some professional coaches who go back, look at Herm Edwards, who go back to the the college ranks, do do pretty well, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a good, interesting question. I think they have equally um, probably the same amount of importance. But I do see there's a there's a common denominator in winning cultures, and that's a coach that's been around there for a minute. Because he controls the culture. So I want to share with you something. This was Joy Taylor's. I wanted to make sure you had seen it. This was Joy, Joy Taylor's for our viewers. Jason Taylor's sister. Okay. Joy Taylor's also a high level um, sports analyst. Okay. He's also the aunt for many NCAA players who are. I, I know that, Faith, but I want mm-hmm. our viewers. Oh, okay. I just want to, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can Google okay. it. I'm about to show you her page. It's more along the lines of what she said and not. Okay who she is. I love a good unqualified man hire. Woo! Love it. Love it. I love it. Here's why I love it. I mean, obviously I'm being sarcastic. I don't love it. This is embarrassing. We're talking about things bigger than a nice person getting an opportunity. An opportunity that he is completely unqualified for. Right. Completely unqualified for. And I don't want to hear about the playing. Coaching is an experience that you have to have experience for. And we undermine it constantly by these hires. So what really bothers me is every time these unqualified, wildly unqualified hires happen, nobody wants to give it the attention that it deserves when we're talking about black head coaches. You have no experience, none, zero, none, no experience in college or, or professionally. And what is the word that we always hear when it comes to black coaches being hired? Oh, they just don't have enough experience. Yep. This is this is why when people start start their whole production about oh everybody's politically correct now and everybody's so sensitive and you're always complaining about stuff. This I don't know what's a better example of I can get a beer with this guy than this. This is a good old boys club if I've ever seen it. And the next time we're talking about this, don't come to me. Don't slide out of your little troll hole to tell me that this never happens. What is this? This Reggie Wayne is on the staff, my guy, on the staff. How are you going to look me in the face and tell me that this is anything other than what it is? How? If Reggie wasn't on the staff, 
Maybe. <laughs> and I'm still really not trying to hear it. But Reggie's on the staff. There's other guys on the staff that fit as well. Yes, yes. Like yes. Mentioned, because because they made this the criteria yeah. that all you had to be was a player. It's, it's, it's I got to get my beer drinking together. <laughs> Let me. <laughs> oh. So I know that you hadn't seen that because here's my <laughs> He hits it on the head, right? And it's 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 okay for us to say, well, I don't know if this one's a race one. And it's like, er, hold on, hold yeah. on, hold on. Yeah. It isn't. It feeds into it, it feeds into the narrative. It feeds into it. That we, you like. Here's my thing. It just shows the level of hypocrisy again within the National Football League to say we want to provide spaces for diversity. We want to provide comfortable spaces for women, for minorities, right? We also want to say we're going to work on the hiring process to make sure that the people representing and coaching and working with these organizations also look like the talent on the field, right? And that's also a great opportunity. They told us, you know what, we're going to put we put together medical things. So they're pulling from HBCUs to get more diverse and black athletic trainers within the NFL. They're creating spaces for women to work within these um, teams and organizations that aren't just, you know, awkward, weird, woman shoved positions like assistants and stuff like that. We're going to make sure that organizations get more money or more benefits or stuff when they hire in the pot of it, div diversity and inclusion. But then we come to this situation and we just talked about the Indianapolis Colts and their ability to have already broken barriers. Let's not forget that's not just the end. You have to be consistent in your hiring process. And here's my thing. If they had came to the press conference and were like, Indianapolis Colts and NFL fans, we don't care about the rest of the season. We just want to get ready to just build for the next upcoming season in the NFL draft. So we are hiring Jeff Saturday. And we will see what Jeff does. He believes in the Indianapolis Colts organization. He has played in our organization. We're just going to see how it goes. But don't hire – like, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, let's say we're throwing in the towel – so we're just going to go with a marketing ticket sales hire. Because at the end of the day, when you hire for a players, when you hire personalities, at the end of the day, they're a figurehead, right? They are The coach is just as important as the players, right? Who you hire is a big deal. So just say your ticket sales are down, okay, or something. Because this, the, it, it's once again, hypocrisy. Looks strange here. <laughs> no, so, oh, I, it doesn't look strange. It it is. That's all. Like, it, it's Oh, my God. Here's the thing. I know having conversations about race and everything coming back down to the race is exhausting. Like, don't worry. Like, people of color also feel that way, too. It's exhausting. But it goes down to the fact that if we want to do better, if we want to continuously having hard conversations, we have to look at the situation and be like, ah, okay, so this is what they're talking about. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Because this doesn't make any dang sense. I'm sorry. Right? He could literally, his blood could really literally run blue. And I still would be like, I don't know, guys. Like, if you really, really cared about this, that's what I'm trying to say. Just be open and say, we don't care about the dang season. That's why we hired Jeff. Just say that. You know what I mean? Because if they really did care about the season, if they cared about the upward mobility of their organization, they would have hired people within staff, regardless of race, right? But they would hire someone in their program right now who deserves the opportunity and has the actual experience to coach. And that's what I was trying to tell you. Like winning at the college level is so like, it's so interesting because like, yes, you have to have a coach that can understand because they're literally teaching amateur athletes at the college level how to be better at their craft right but the real thing is if you don't have good players at the college level you're not going to coach for long let's just be real you know what i mean at the professional level it's no longer really about teaching but more about like how can someone command an organization how can someone you know what i mean little things like that 
So when this hire was made, it was like he has probably no personal connections with his current uh, roster, right? Nor the staff, right? Who lost their jobs, honestly, probably bringing him in. There's a lot of stuff that went into this that people are looking at and be like, why him? If you wanted to just grab a player and say, let's throw in the towel for the season, you could have gone with a direction that at least pushed the conversation you were trying to push. It's just diversity and inclusion within the NFL National Football League. You know? So that's that's I just wanted to. So yes, I have heard about this, and this is. I'm just confused. Well, it's definitely a slap in the face to most black coaches. Simple as that. Yeah, it, it is. And and that's but here's the thing. It is. And for people to see it and be like, this is, I mean, I he played there. It's not enough, guys. It's not enough to just have played, no matter what you look like. You have to have experience. Because if it if that wasn't the case. Why the heck do we go to college? Wait. You know what I mean? Why do we go to school? Why do we get internships? Why do we get our first jobs? Why do we, all those things, right? Why do people babysit before they have kids? Why do people, all types of stuff. You can't just go into life head feet first. Well, here's the problem. This is this is what angers and what frustrates most black coaches is that there's no black NFL equivalent of a Jeff Saturday. No. Black players with zero coaching experience can't just walk off the field and get a head coaching job. It's simple as that. Let's it makes the situation so embarrassing. But it also goes back to, and we loved the Steve Nash hire. But let's be real about one other one. Luke Walton being hired as the Lakers head coach. What? How did that go? And I didn't mind having Luke Walton the head coach. I was a Lakers fan. I did not care. I liked the idea of keeping it in-house. But it doesn't mean he should have been the head coach. Right. It doesn't mean Magic Johnson should have been a GM. Right? Like, it's just sometimes it's like, and that just goes along the lines. People who play can't always coach. And that's something we see. We have seen bad coaches. If you've played in a sports, you've seen what happens when a player should not be in coaching. And that's just not a good fit. Okay? It's not. Normally, it's not good for the players. Right. We see a lot of situations with allegations um, because coaches can't learn to communicate effectively like they should as a coach, but more of the players. So it's just a lot of stuff that goes into it. Like if we have a system, let's follow the system, which is what are their credentials? Oh, OK, cool. All right. Now you can sit down at the dang table. Right. It's just it's experience matters. Experience matters in a multi-million dollar organization. You know what I mean? Like this isn't just. We're passing over the the Central Michigan football team. We're talking about the Indianapolis Colts, the Super Bowl champions. You know what I mean? So that that I just wanted to make sure I had shared that because yeah, there's two conversations to this, and one of them is so washed out, and we keep having the same conversation. But at the end of the day, that's just the situation. If you don't have experience, you should not get the position, right? Right. Crawl, walk, run. Pay your dues. Everyone else has to. And I'm not trying to be a hater because here's my thing. I really would. I think that's a great opportunity for him and his family. Woohoo. The only issue is that's not really his opportunity to take. You know, that's what's hard about it. Right. And so, but that's life. You know what I mean? You can't always control everything. Well, let, let's do something, Faith. I, I'm glad we, we kind of pivoted. I want to pivot. I wanted to just touch on, um, this weekend's experience and what's the and the significance of it. Um, got a chance to watch Yale play Princeton, go see Devin. Um, and it was a unbelievable game. Yale pulled it out. But now next week, uh, Yale will play um, Harvard, which is one of the longest, most historical football rivalries uh, in, in college football for the Ivy League championship which is coming up mm -hmm. and I don't know if you got a chance to, I, I sent you a couple of pictures and then I want to yeah. pivot it to maybe a little bit of our topic, but uh, it was, it was, it was historical. Um, and uh, again, got a chance to spend some time with them. And, uh, and uh, I guess uh, mm -hmm. there was a glitch to the tickets over 3000 uh, Yale students will not be able to go to the game because when they went online, they got knocked off. So, those 3,000 tickets that were supposed to go to Yale students um, got sold out. 
So just so you know, we can't go to the away games when we play UNC, right? I just want everyone to understand what a rivalry is supposed to look like, okay? You're not supposed to be all up in each other's spaces. But I, regardless of how big the stadiums are, we are not, you're not supposed to be all up in each other's base. I, the, I went to the Duke game at the Final Four, and I said, no, we're not supposed to be any the, – there's a reason why this doesn't happen. So this is very interesting. But here's the photos I wanted to share with you. Um, and I did see that if Harvard beats Yale next week, I'm pretty sure that means Harvard would – it would be a four-way of three high, something Chris, like that. Chris, no, Chris, when the uh... – the Princeton would win the Ivy League championship. So right now, the only only team that's undefeated is is there's no team that's undefeated. No, Yale is actually not. Yale's actually uh, Yale and, and uh, Princeton are the only tied. one. Yeah. So if, if Princeton uh, if Yale wins, uh, they win the Ivy League championship. Not outright, but they do they do because they did beat Princeton. Harvard has two wins, two losses. Right, but they do ties. Right. Yeah, they'll, they'll be co-champions. Yeah, so it'll tie. Right. Okay. Like, tie. Right. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure you saw that because I had read a couple articles yesterday reading it, and I was like, "This uh, that doesn't count. You can't tie. But soccer and football confuse me. I believe um, they – so when, when you know what basketball would have did, and they still probably would have did a tie, but basketball is so like stupid with how they do it is they would have taken by points. So like how much you beat if you both beat the same person, they'd say whoever beat them the most somehow. I think that's not fair, but yeah, it should be right now. They it should be head to head uh, um, uh, results. So if, if, if because Yale beat Preston, Yale should be the outright Ivy League champions. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's not the case, but. You know what? You actually said, I want to pivot. If you don't want to mind, I want to pivot about Generation Z. I thought it was so significant in terms oh, of. Hold on, hold on one second. I went to see Black Panther last night. I just wanted oh. to have a conversation. We can, next week then, huh? Huh? <laughs> we, can, we can do Generation Z next week then. <laughs> no, no, no. We can have this conversation um, and we'll go into Generation Z because Generation Z, didn't we? We're going to talk about Generation Z because we just came off those midterm elections and Generation Z completely flipped yeah. our legal system, our judicial system, our everything this past week, um, which is actually we've never seen something like this happen. We're starting to say that. Um, but I went to see Black Panther last evening. Long film, per usual. Um, very sad, obviously, because... Chadwick Boseman has passed since the beginning of the first one due to cancer. Um, and that's how they start the film directly from that point on. Um, I think it was so well done. Now, here's my thing. Instead of the battle, I just want people to know this because some people might not pick it up like I did with my historical brain. Going into immediately, you see what it is. They have an emergence of a new tribe that is from the native indigenous people, right? And those two go head to head. So you have two minority tribes. You have Wakandans who are central black and you have native indigenous uh, for like Mayan roots, Mexico, that type of conversation. And it's very interesting that you have Africa and indigenous native, both conquered by conquistadors, killed by illness, killed by slavery, having this, this just go see it. Very well put together, very well written. Overall, just a nice, interesting twist to what they could have done in the second film. Um, colors are beautiful per usual, well written, funny, um, just great actresses. Um, you see a glimpse of everybody, but um, Lord, we're not it. <laughs> Angela Bassett, of course. Angela Bassett, Lupita is amazing, most beautiful woman on the earth. So just go see the film. Very well done. It went 180 million in opening weekend or Solid. opening day. I'm sorry, not just opening weekend, opening day. <laughs> um, which is no shock. It's a Marvel film, but very great movie. Um, I don't know what I liked more, the first or the second. Of course, I'm a chat. I'm like the I was the biggest Chadwick fan. So I um uh, this one was hard not to have him in it, but I really, really enjoyed it overall, just how they put it together, because it, it, it has been long in the making to make this film. Thanks for sharing that. 
No problem. No problem. It's worth it. We sat in the front row too. So it's worth it. Um, to, um, <laughs> go see it. We, we sat in the front row. Um, so I would say go see it. Um, but yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Generation Z. So in the past, and I want to kind of break down what's happening right now. We have about 20 minutes. So I wanted to make sure. So right now in current society, we had the midterm elections. And then we also have the death and funeral of Twitter happening at the same time. So Elon Musk bought Twitter because he could. Um, Twitter was not for sale. I want to make sure people know that. Twitter was not for sale. But he said, I'll give you this much money. And they were like, well, are we going to say no to billions of dollars? So he bought Twitter and immediately fired the ethics team. The ethics team is the people that filter through the tweets and make sure there's no terrorists, uh, hate speech, um, racial discrimination, all types of stuff, violence, all types of stuff, right? He fired those people. Within the first week of his him taking over, he sent a mass-wide company email out to everyone and said, on Friday evening, you will get an email telling you if you're still on staff or not on staff. To the entire Twitter <laughs> Twitter company, right? That, and this is a, think about it. Twitter doesn't just stay in North America. It's everywhere, right? So almost 50% of the people have lost jobs. Um, 50%, a lot of them quit and resigned. A lot of people, you saw Whoopi Goldberg, I said this the other day, she hopped off Twitter. Um, right now, currently, the trend on Twitter is that people are, are celebrating the funeral of Twitter, so they're being stupid and, and putting their funeral robes on and taking pictures and um, <laughs> putting trends out um, because Twitter is on the end. And the reason I say this is because the people behind the funeral of Twitter is Generation Z. Okay. So it's millennials and Generation Z. I think Devin's Generation Z, I'll be honest with you, I get confused. After um, 1996. 19 mid to late 1990s. Okay, so I'm Generation Z, so early yeah. 2010s. So Devin and I are both Generation Z. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we have seen also simultaneously and in parallel is the midterm elections. Um, originally, there was supposed to be this red wave, right? And the, the Republicans said they were going to flip everything and basically push the laws on abortion and the laws on immigration and the laws on all types of stuff that they have motives for. Oh, yeah, the, the keeping the guns legal um, without gun laws. Democrats, Democrats, in particular, Generation Z and women and Black people were the ones that turned out to vote the most and completely demolished any form of direction from the Republican Party. Um, and it was, like they said, it was record-breaking. They have never seen that age group vote as much as it did with as much intent and motivation behind it to get as this midterm election. It was so interesting to see. So we wanted to kind of talk about what it was that kind of pushed Generation Z to be this next m motivator machine behind the new direction the country is trying to go in. Um, and it's very encouraging to see, regardless of what you believe. And you should very much be excited for the fact that this generation who is now the next change makers and decision makers for this country to really begin to activate on their status and their importance within not just our politics, but our sports and our um, pop culture and our social media platforms. Like we have to really start to see how amazing this movement is happening and, and where it could possibly go. I mean, it's a very big deal. Um, so I, before I dive into this, did you have any questions that you think I mean, it's not just a, a generational thing, but just as you, as someone who is one of the older generations, has by witnessing and watching all of this. Right. I'm embracing it because the one characteristic is that diversity is their norm. Mm -hmm. Diversity is their yeah. norm. And it's just one of the core characteristics of Generation Z is their racial diversity. Yeah. Uh, you know, generally, it'll be the last generation that is predominantly white. A slight majority of Generation Z, 50%, is white. 25% is Hispanic, 14% is black, and 4% is Asian. So you see that trend, but you can see that because, you know, I've always embraced that, you know. I think having Generation Z kids has really allowed me, uh, you know, me having 
so much history, being being blessed with my age and being able to grow up in the late 50s and early 60s to see how impactful this is, you know, to have uh, you know this this generation of, of of kids that part of my life, I'm so embracing of it, you know. So there's yeah. so much that that I just embraced about it. Yeah. So there's a. F- I just want to walk us through the ten cultural trends that um, make Gen Z, like you said, so powerful, and the reason why it's so much. Because here's the thing: it's easy to look at and be like, "Yeah, duh, young people are pushing the movement. We've seen that for years." No, this is a young generation that was raised within social media. So there's the way they do things is so different than everywhere else. So I'm just gonna go with the first one, and you said it well. It's a blended identity, right? So they're more willing to want to hear the perspective of an LGBTQ person or the perspective of an indigenous a descendant person or the, the transgender. Like they, they have seen amazing breakdowns of people, straight heterosexual people asking questions like, dear um, gender, I mean, non-binary per people, how does it feel to be under that umbrella or do you feel missed out on the fact that it's an overall umbrella term? And right, they're diving into that to try to see how people want to be represented and spoke about, like the intent to do that, right? The, the energy to want to do that is so self, oh, like pushing away and, and getting out of yourself and into others is, is just a big focus that I have seen. And it's not just me because I'm on like, like the older side of Gen Z, um, but seeing as my brother is right in the middle. Yeah, yeah. The way that he speaks on things, and I'm going to say a few to you, and even the last conversation we had as a family, you his reasoning behind why he wouldn't take an opportunity near politics is so motivated by the personality of his generation that it's so common to see that all of them have this type of conscious awareness of what they're doing with their lives. The next one is they create these niche micro tribes. So the things that they like, so van life, people that travel around the world in vans, right? They have um, like puppy owners or puppy dads or all these different things that maybe like we wouldn't think much about they take pride in as their identity and gravitate to people who just have those similar interests, right? And one thing about when you gravitate to people with a hobby, those people can look so different than you, right? In comparison to sports, sports very much is heavily geographical, right? And so a lot of the times the sports you play factor into the, what the people look like alongside of you. So when you go to together with interests like hobbies, you have a better chance of being a more inclusive and diverse space, mm-hmm. which that starts very early on for a lot of them because they have social media. So they're interacting with different kinds of people from an earlier age. And then another one be um, the crowd account economy. This is Twitter. Okay, so they get on Twitter and they basically see, okay, this is what people talk about today. Today is the funeral of Twitter. Okay, so they jump into that and lean into that and they're up to date with the news and they can see what Elon Musk emails were sending. When Elon Musk fired all those people, those people screenshotted the email and put it on Twitter immediately. Right. And so the entire Generation Z who's on Twitter more than anybody else. Right is looking at these things and they're like, this is outrageous. This is, and they start to do this mob mentality, right? And build up and they're trying to do the things to make the change happen, which is not a surprise. Hence why we're seeing the death of Twitter. (sighs) And this is the one we were talking about, dad. This is the one moral imperative, right? This is what I was talking about with Devin. Gen Z is passionate and they'll use Twitter to not only call for what's right, but also activate those values. During the election with Joe Biden, I saw more petitions circling around on social media than I have ever before. Petitions for Brittany Griner, petitions for Breonna Taylor, petitions for like p- climate control, like uh, the ban on substances overseas, right? Like just small things like that. like. They're so passionate about making sure that they're aligning their lives with something that's morally correct. 
And that's the first time we've really seen people lead their lives, not off of money or opportunity, but more along the lines of like, will I be able to sleep at night if I take this position? Will I be able to sleep at night if I work along someone like aside someone like that who who drives a Hummer, right? Little things like that. They're so, and it's not a bad way, they're so empathetic towards others. And like even sometimes where I'll have a conversation with my brother, who, like I said, is the middle of Gen Z, while I'm the older side of Gen Z, he'll say stuff to me that I'll be like, yeah, whatever. Like, like he'll be like, no. People shouldn't talk. He, if a woman wears this outside, he'll be like, people shouldn't comment about what she likes to wear because it's her body. And I'll sit there and I'll be like, I didn't teach you this. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is something I could have taught you, right? Like what not to say, what to say, how to allow people to just be themselves, like small things like that. I could have easily taught you that. But that's something that as a mass generation, they're in school alongside each other. And if someone's like trying to bully someone, they're probably more likely to be like, why are you bullying? Bullying's lame, right? Yeah. Because my I, I, generation was more like, why are you smoking cigarettes? Smokers, cigarettes are gross. Right. Well, their generation is like, don't bully, don't litter, don't, right? They're more conscious of the responsibility they have as individuals and how it impacts others, right. you know? You know, I'm laughing. It's because when we have our, our family conversations, I am always getting in trouble. Right? Yeah, because here's the thing. you weren't taught, <laughs> right? You weren't taught that, like, why did I say that? Well, here's the thing. What you said, right, even though no one's heard, it's just the very factor that when you put things out in the world, you just mm -hmm. never know how it's going to imp impact someone collaterally. Yeah. And so that's what I think they're so great at is they genuinely are like, if I don't vote, this could be, uh, my vote could be the one deciding factor that Herschel Walker would then be important. Do you know what I mean? Like they are so in tune yeah. with what's going on and they're so willing to just not care about what impacts them. And that is so exciting to see because we are, a country built on constant power taking mentality and career chasing and success chasing. And even social media was built on that ide ideology as well. But they're more willing to be like, I have to pay more in taxes. Okay. It's just the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's like, okay. <laughs> All right, fine. So it's just very morally imperative. They will do everything and they can feel it all so much deeper than we can. And then the fifth one is icon top link, right? We've seen more Confederate statues go down in the last 20 years, 15 years, 10 years than we have ever seen since the Civil War was completed. Okay. They are more willing to see, like, this is, they took down Oprah. You know what I mean? They took down the Clintons, right? They're taking down the Obamas. They don't care. It's the most intriguing thing. They don't care what you look like, what you sound like, what you did. At the end of the day, if you've done something wrong, and this is where I, I go head to head with you. If you did something wrong, they're like, no, they shouldn't be in charge. No, they shouldn't be an icon. No, they shouldn't. They like will literally be like, no, and that's where cancel culture has started to be birthed. And and because the moment you say one bad thing, they're like, no, no, you're out. You're out. There's no thing <laughs> for you here, <laughs> right? So and so at the end of the day, it's very bad. It's very unfortunate because it's easy. I mean, shoot, we're watching it happen to Kyrie Irving right now. Is it's, it's oh, easy for word. It's easy for words to get stretched. In, in ideologies being put on people when you're as a mob mentality upset about an overall topic. But it is encouraging to see them really being like very cutthroat about what is allowed to be said to multiple millions of people in this world. And whatever, just I'm gonna keep my, you know, be safe out here. It's cancel culture will get you. Okay. And here's my uh, the last one everyday so celebrity. You can't tell these Generation Z kids individually that they're not they're not celebrities. You can't, right? Because they have social media and they have this form of a following, whether it's 500 people, 
to 12,000 people, to 45,000 people. They have an audience. And because of social media, it allows you to kind of, all, all of us have a platform to tell a story. And because of that, as we're going into midterm elections, for example, we saw so many people get on social media and say, did you vote today? I voted. This is how I'm voting. And this is where I'm voting. And this is why I'm voting. Did you vote? Or we saw a lot of people, here's your poll centers. This is how you register. This is how you do a mail-in. We saw little things like that. People use their individual platforms, right? Yep. Even though they're not a celebrity, right? There's no way would they walk in a room and a bunch of people who don't know them be like, oh my God, I know that person. No, that won't happen. But it's the idea that because we have social media, we have access to everybody. And when you have access to everybody, everybody has access to you. So your story, the things you say will be heard, right? And so the idea that they're being raised in a space that what they're saying can be heard by anybody, then encourages them to use that platform for good or evil, but really for good, especially what we just saw with these midterm elections, Gen Z completely annihilated any efforts by the Republican Party, right, that we saw. We've never seen anything like that. Regardless of how you voted, it's like they like people are like blown away who aren't part of the Generation Z era because they're like, we normally don't count that vote. You know, like normally they don't come out and vote, but now they are 21 years old, 22 years old, they're 20, 20, like they're 25 to 18, right? That's that generation that now can vote, that's now on social media, that's now having these hard conversations and completely canceling people out of their lives because of how they vote. It's just such a more, like I said, morally conscious, empathetic mentality that we've ever seen before. And it's extremely encouraging because it goes beyond politics. It goes to sports. We're seeing the younger generation of athletes now becoming the top of leagues. We're seeing, right, like we've had this conversation about the Josh Allens and the Patrick Mahomes and the um, Lamar Jacksons. And then we have the conversations about Tatum and Jalen Brown and Trey Young and John Morant. Like these younger generation Z athletes, right, on the top of their paths, making millions of dollars, right, but also speaking out towards politics, towards societal issues, towards like we're just seeing the shift happen. And it's a, I would just make sure you're constantly paying attention to, okay, this made me feel some type of way. Because here's the thing, let's talk, the Jeff Saturday hiring, right? This made me feel some type of way, right? Generation Z looked at him and were like, no, 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 no. He doesn't deserve that job, right? <laughs> What's the qualifications, right? They they took that and ripped it in half, right? They were like, no, no, no. This is exactly why we don't mess with the NFL. They, even if Generation Z watches the NFL after the Deshaun Watson situation, because that was another thing, they weren't rocking with the Browns. But now they're definitely, they're definitely, you know what I mean? They're more like, here's the thing. They're more like, you guys are going to take football away from us? You know what? I'm willing to lose football for the rights of women, right? It's just weird things like that that are inspiring, but also you look back as like, as you as an older and you're like, God, you guys are, will risk it all for <laughs> the change, for the opportunity. And it's like, here's the thing, maybe Generation G Z is just a rep repetition of the past generations at this same age group. But the one thing they have that our older generations didn't have, and we'll see what the younger generations, generations do create, is social media and the ability to have a platform even as a regular, regular person. You know, that's a big deal. Because Joe Schmo can make Joe, like many 500 Joe Schmoes. You know, like that's, social media is a very powerful tool and they are the most aware and educated on social media than any generation. So I just want to make sure we touch on that because this midterm election, just the news right now covering this, this generation from the late 90s to the early 2010s is a very interesting group to keep an eye on. 
and see kind of where they're swaying because I can promise you the direction that they're swaying is probably the way you should be trying to sway. Right, right. I mean, they're, they are doing what they need to be done to educate themselves. You know, one more important, uh, but many factors contribute to their mental health challenges. They are bringing so much more awareness to mental health. Yeah. Right, they're, they're speaking to it. They're, they're talking about it, you know? And that's awesome. Yeah, easily. But okay, wonderful show. We got to dive into a lot of conversations. Um, if you guys haven't seen Black Panther, go check it out. Just catch the late night show. It is pretty long, so drink your coffee. Um, we've had amazing conversations around Gen Z, and this is the thing that we focus when we look safe as a vehicle to help strengthen and sustain the family core of our viewers. And of course, our slogan Let go, let God, let go, let faith, and let go, let love. Great show. Everyone, Kate. have a wonderful Monday, and we'll see you soon.